Um, here's my disclosures. Uh, I'm a consultant for Edwards, consultant for Atricure, and a consultant for Onyx uh, uh, Life Technologies. Um, so let's talk a little bit about, just to get started, about why some surgeons avoid doing mental injury. We're going to talk about, we're going to use the term MIS, which stands for Minimal Incision Surgery, Minimal Incision Cardiac Surgery. So what are those reasons? Um, I really think still lingering some 23 years later is the Hartport experience. Um, Hartport got a bad reputation, um, and uh, honestly, some of it was deserved. Um, the technology was used uh, indiscriminately, and, and the entire uh, cardiac surgical field rushed into Hartport, and uh, there were a lot of um, complications that occur that should not have occurred. I'm not going to go into great detail about that now, but suffice it to say that that had a very brief lifespan, Hartport did, in the early, mid-90s. Um, and But from that learning experience uh, came and evolved mentally uh, valve surgery. That platform was then uh, transitioned into minimally invasive valve surgery, and there were a number of early pioneers, such as uh, Hugo Van Ehrman, Fred Moore, uh, Will Ryan, uh, as well as Randy Chitwood, that recognized the value of those uh, of the Hartport platform and could extract that and adapt that to uh, minimally invasive valve surgery. And so that's the basic concept of what we're using today. Uh, originated from that time period. Um, it's a change in technique. It puts us surgeons out of our comfort zone. We surgeons don't like to be out of our comfort zone. We like to be very comfortable with what we're doing because we're doing very highly technical, sophisticated work. It's very routine work, but it's still very technical. It's very sophisticated, and uh, it's very standardized in that. We have expectations that are placed upon us. We have expectations of ourselves to have a perfect outcome every time. No one will never achieve out of that comfort zone is very difficult for us, and it's understandable. Um, and it requires not an insignificant learning curve to do mental incision surgery. Um, so why work harder? We're already working hard enough. We're doing cases from 7 a.m. till 10, 11 o'clock at night. Some cases are taking four, five, six hours. The days of doing a couple of triple bypasses and being out by 2 or 3 o'clock is over. I mean, we're seeing third-time redos, fourth-time redos, and I know you gentlemen in the room, I don't have to tell you that, you're seeing a lot of very difficult valve surgery and dealing with a lot of difficult. So this is a, a not a valve repairs, especially when it comes to microsurgery, minimal incision. That's wrong, and, and Dr. Blair is going to address that because you'll, you will see that your exposure will be enhanced with minimally invasive valve surgery, especially when it comes to mitral surgery, um, once you uh, get the techniques down. And finally, at least in this country, uh, professional liability is a real issue. So um, you're, getting, you're exposing yourself really without proper training, experience. What is proper training and experience in, in 2015? Uh, we have a lawyer on every block in the US, and uh, they're just ready to pounce on any little thing that they see. So that's the perception that, that we have, and that, that, that provides some uh, inertia for some uh, surgeons getting into it, and understandably so. So this is the classic uh, curve that's an unavoidable reality, really, for all of us, even surgeons. We as surgeons are somewhere. We will fall on this curve. Some of us are early adopters. Uh, some are in the early majority. Some are in the late majority. Then there are those of us that are laggards in terms of adoption of new technologies, new principles, of new concepts. This is just, just the nature of human uh, reality. And so uh, we're not immune to that. So some folks, um, like the names I mentioned before, were way back here in the early 2000s, 2004, and um, others have been getting on later on. When you, when you think about mental invasive surgery, you have a programmatic standpoint. That's very important. We will emphasize this as we go through. Um, so the surgeon is no longer working alone. You are totally dependent on your anesthesiologist, and I will emphasize the word totally, and Dr. Stout will be showing you that, why that is. And to some degree, you are dependent upon your perfusionist. Okay, 
Um, so it is a combined effort among the surgeon, the anesthesiologist, and the perfusionist. So no longer the captain of the ship. Okay, those days are gone with mental, mental decisions. It's a team sport. And you've got to have all team members on board, and you've got to have everyone present and accounted for, and everybody knows what the play is. Everybody knows what's going to be going on. So this importance of team dynamic cannot be overemphasized. If all of those circles of understanding, collaboration, and integration intersect, then you've got a successful outcome for a program. It will happen if you have everybody it and dedicated to do this with you. Other program considerations. Um, it really it requires some, uh, obviously, prop, uh, proper uh, preparation and training and wire skill sets if you're already doing then you're well down the road. You have an understanding of uh, skill sets from your cardiology colleagues and that you're developing in the, in the TAVAR uh, rooms. In terms of anesthesia considerations, because you're going to end up using those in the course of different cases in different ways. And again, Dr. Stout will be going into that. It's imperative. It's essential for being able to see where these wires are going, where um, uh, imaging is going to be, uh, uh, and imaging will be playing a very significant role. The perfusionist really needs to understand the procedure. He needs to understand what's going on with the procedure. Um, need to understand what's going to contribute to the case, especially in terms of exposure. Because if, you've, if you're doing a mentally, you don't drain the percentage is going to be right. And it's evacuated, and you're going to be able to see perfectly just like you would on an open case. So what is Well, this is what we've done for many, many years, since the 1950s. Uh, it sort of evolved to this. This is not MIS, all right? Um, with the retractor, it has uh, evolved to this. This is getting a little bit better. This is... Uh, the techniques basically that we use here through a fourth uh, interspace uh, four centimeter incision. Dr. Lair is going to be talking about this when it comes to mitral. And then uh, finally, this is uh, the robotic procedure that is being utilized around the country. So there are different phases and different ways to go about this, and it really needs to be staged. If you uh, decide to make a serious commitment on this, um, we will be talking more about how to sort of get in this in a very safe way for your patients. So why do this? I mean, you know, again, working hard already. Why, why do I need to go about doing this? Well, the surgeon benefits uh, in terms of your visualization. Um, you the, the, see the mitral in the anatomic position. So when I first started, I go back and look at all of my studies uh, and pictures that I've taken of my patients. When I first started, my incision for my mitral patients were basically um, halfway between the nipple on the, uh, on the right side um, halfway medial and halfway lateral. In the last 150 patients I've done, it's way out over here because you begin to get more and more comfortable about being further away and you realize that the mitral valve, like my mitral valve oriented for me, it sits like this. So you're looking directly into the mitral valve. The further lateral you get, the more direct on that you're seeing the mitral valve. The valve A couple ways of that. Visualization with mitral valve, where you're looking directly in, uh, or videoscopic, we sort of use a combination of those two, or robotic. Uh, the robot is a tool, but it is a tool, it doesn't mandate that you have to do it that way. Um, direct visualization and videoscopic really accomplish the same goals. It gives you a motionless and clear feel. Obviously, that's of paramount importance when it comes to any form of surgery, whether you're doing hernia repair or you're doing cardiac surgery. Um, you can do repair or replacement, either one. 
And uh, it really does help to continue to put you on the continuum of a skill set development and refinement for present and future advanced technologies. As you know, Tavar lecture. I've been giving this lecture for several years now, and I used to talk about future technologies. Now, I mean, Tavar is here, it's present, it's, you know, it's a standard of care, it's within our armamentarium. Very close on us is percutaneous micro valve replacements. Okay. And uh, there, that's already in the pipeline by several companies. Uh, and so we as surgeons will need to stay in that game. As, as you know, if you look at for every one Tavar, there's probably going to be three or four percutaneous uh, patients available for micro valve repair and replacement. All of these techniques continue to be uh, assessed and assimilated as we go forward to decide what is the best thing for the patient in any given situation. And all of y'all that are doing TAVR, exposed to TAVR, you realize that now already, that you sit in the TAVR meetings and you discuss intimately with your cardiologist, should we do TAVR, should we do TAVR, surgical or valve replacement, surgical or patient. That discussion is going to get more and more complicated and, and bigger and broader. So the hospital benefits, uh, in what ways? It's seen as an MIS center. It uh, really helps competitive recruitment for surgeons because surgeons want to be able to uh, do this and provide this for their patients, and they want to have a platform, they want to have a program, they want to have anesthesiologists and perfusionists that understand it. They want to have uh, this model that we've talked about of integra integrated approach. Uh, patient satisfaction is very high. Uh, patients really enjoy having mentally invasive valve surgery. Um, rather than sternotomy, and, and, and we'll seek it out. We, uh, we get calls all the time from the Pacific Northwest of patients. Uh, in fact, I just had some, one patient recently come from Philadelphia all the way across the country to have their um, mitral valve surgery evaluated here. Um, there's a decreased cost, and that's why hospitals really like this. The perception is that it costs more because of the product. That is not correct. We've actually done studies on that. Uh, there's a zero external wound complication. Uh, because you're not touching the sternum, which this is a huge expense in this country. Um, uh, decreased length of stay and increased or decreased time to return to work. So patients get back to work more quickly, especially true with mitral, to some degree with aortic, with a mini upper sternotomy. And reduced blood uh, usage. We at Swedish have looked at this here, and uh, if you look at our open cases for mitral valve repair, uh, it's about 24% blood utilization, some componentry, and minimally invasive is 3%. Highly statistically significant. Uh, and it really is keeping you on the track, preparing for the next generation of uh, surgical technology that's down the pike. But most importantly, the patient benefits. All right, and again, the hospital's great, surgeon's fine, but it's really all about the patient. And uh, there really is what I call decreased wound burden. Obviously, if you compare it to a sternotomy versus an incision like this, it's in the intercostal space. With about three port sites, uh, the patient feels much better, and there's less trauma to the patient. Uh, there's less pain. Uh, we recently introduced uh, cryotherapy, and so now at the end of our mitral procedures, we're freezing uh, two intercostal spaces above and two intercostal spaces below. And we've done only five patients, but four of those five, five patients literally have had no pain at all. And as you know, a thoracotomy incision can be painful. Um, and one had sort of felt like they had some pain, but they, that, that has been very dramatic. Uh, obviously, with mitrals, it eliminates sternal wound complications. Uh, it does accelerate their recovery, and you can see all of these are referenced. Um, there's a decreased length of stay, decreased need for blood transfusions, and there's a higher percentage of repair versus replacement. Um, this may be a little bit skewed because surgeons that are doing mentally invasive valve surgery usually are very accomplished mitral valve surgeons. So, uh, for instance, in our program here, if we intend to repair the mitral valve with what we call intention to treat analysis, if we intend to repair the mitral valve preoperatively, we repair it about 97% of the time. And so, uh, but we have focused quite a bit on mitral valve surgery, and we do quite a few. So, and of course, approved cosmesis. I put that at the bottom. That's really that's not why I got into this. Patients love it, but I I think all these these first few are the are the main reasons why. Uh, that we're so devoted and passionate about uh, mentally invasive surgery. So what can you use this for? Okay, we can use it for aortic. We can use it for mitral, obviously, mitral valve repair and replacement. But you can also use it for PFOs and ASDs. Uh, you use the platform or the program for uh, atrial myxoma resection. 
Uh, this is an excellent platform to use and a, and a surgical plan to use for patients who had previous cabbage surgery for open grafts and aortic valve patients uh, who need now a mitral valve repair. As you know, if a patient's had a previous aortic valve replacement and need a mitral valve repair replacement, that can be a very difficult pa uh, uh, patient to deal with because if you do it through a sternotomy, mitral valve sitting like this, the aortic valve, if, especially if it's a mechanical valve and it's even true for a, a stented uh, bioprosthesis, is very difficult to expose the mitral valve. And I've had on occasion seen patients, I've never had to do it myself. In fact, I had one of these recently for reasons I couldn't do mentally invasive. Uh, he had terrible peripheral vascular disease. So we did him sternotomy and I was very concerned I was gonna have to take out the aortic prosthesis to be able to see the mitral valve prosthesis. I've seen that happen in two or three cases over the course of 30 years of cardiac surgery. So. Um, I think, that, um, I think that this is an ex excellent application. Uh, and open grafts, you don't, just, you don't have to deal with any of that. You go through the incision over here. It doesn't have to be four centimeters. It can be six centimeters, but you've got the platform. Your anesthesiologist, your perfusionist, everybody's on board. Okay, oh, it's another mentally invasive case. So, um, AFib ablation, you can do a nice uh, AFib ablation through the... Uh, uh, through uh, a mentally invasive approach. The only challenge here that remains for us is how to deal with the left atrial appendage. That's a little bit of an issue. Uh, and you can, uh, you can over-sew it. You can't get the clip in there, not reliably. Niv, Nivod from, uh, from DC and Inova has got a couple of cases where he's been able to get the clip on there, but it's, it's, that's a little sporty. So um, um, we have not tried that here. And then uh, totally endoscopic uh, TCAB, Dr. Larry, just, you may, Larry, you may just want to mention that a little bit later on about uh, some of your experience with that. Eric has done that. He's done 500 cases uh, with uh, Johannes Bonatti. Uh, uh, brought that here to us, too. So why should you do it? Well, it's consistent. The, the results are consistent and reproducible in their techniques. Um, we really feel that the cardiac procedure is really equal or better than in an open case. And once you get this down as a rhythm, as a program, it really you'll see that it's the case. The complications are equal to or less than conventional approach, and patient satisfaction is clearly is much higher than other surgical approaches. Um, so those are the, the, the real issues when it comes to uh, sort of how to think about mentally invasive surgery at a 40,000-foot level. Uh, so in conclusion, this part of the, of the symposium is more, really, the, I can't emphasize enough the importance of this this uh, interdependent uh, team dynamics. I mean, again, you are not going to be, you know, okay, we're going on pump, we're going to do the operation, we're coming off pump. You really are dependent upon your colleagues in the room, and you need to have that um, under understanding up front. You'll see when uh, Dr. Stout, Dr. Lair present their cases that we, <clears throat> everybody agrees in the room. The guide wire is in the SVC. You know, David, Dr. Stout, do you agree? Yes. Uh, Chuck, our perfusionist, do you agree? Yes. Okay, everybody agrees it's in the SVC because the venous cannula that's coming from the groin is going to go follow the guide wire wherever it is. And we don't want the guide wire to be up in the, um, uh, through a PFO or up into the right atrial appendage. So we, we all sign off on that. Uh, patient selection really is critical, and we're going to go into uh, patient selection in, in pretty significant detail, detail because that also impacts program uh, success. Uh, and the final thing that, that I want to emphasize here is that you really want to stage um, uh, your growth and uh, training and working from straightforward cases to more complex cases. In this country, there have been cases, fortunately I don't think there are these many anymore, but in the late uh, 2000s and early teens, uh, patients or, or physicians and surgeons and teams would start their first case to be a robotic mitral valve repair of an A2P2 prolapse, I mean, with an endoballoon. I mean, that, that's ridiculous. I mean, that's just, it's not safe for anyone. It's not safe for the patient. That's the main concern. But it's really unwise to do something like that. When it comes to um, aortic valve replacement, we will show you a technique that is very adaptable uh, and, and something that you could just start fairly quickly uh, when you return to your own respective programs. Many mitral, uh, for instance, if you still, if, uh, if you have a patient who just needs a ring, that's the best case to start out with. Um, and if you somebody that needs leaflet areas, maybe just a P2, a little resection of a P2 in a ring, that's a good case to start out with. But you don't want to start out with complex cases because that becomes very, very problematic. 
So let me stop there. If you have any questions about any of that, anybody have any thoughts or any issues? Okay, let me go on to um, the next topic here. I noticed the sound like it was cutting in and out. Yes. Yes, we're going to go into that. Okay. Yeah, yeah, we're going to we're going to go into that in great detail. He asked uh, uh, criteria for patient selection, so we're going to go into that in just a little bit. It may be because I had it over here, turning my head too much. Uh, ADD is cutting in and out. Yeah. So um, let's talk a little bit about preoperative patient selection and planning. That's uh, what we're going to deal with here. And uh, this, again, uh, the team is important. Preoperative planning and patient selection is important. Um, the other thing that I would like to, to comment on is that um, you, know, the, you have to think about these cases entirely differently from your other cases. You know, we, we get sort of in a routine and a drill in case you've got patients, you've got you know, triple vessel coronary disease, left main, I'm uh, distal left main, I'm going to do everything on the left side, do, go do a right if there's a high grade right, or he's got aortic stenosis, cabbage, here's, here's what we're going to do. But these cases bring to the table their own distinct, unique set of issues. And it's not complicated, but you just have to be aware of them, recognize them, and acknowledge them as you move forward in the, in the evaluation process. So that's what we're going to, I'm going to try to elucidate here um, at this sec uh, section of the talk. So first, let me go over what we consider here the four inviolate principles of doing safe cardiac surgery. Um, you can do cardiac surgery through a pinhole. You can do it through a sternotomy and a laparotomy and just split the whole patient open. But you can never violate these four principles. If you do, the patient will be harmed. And um, this is so true with minimally invasive surgery. So you have to establish and you have to maintain adequate perfusion and cannulation. That's obviously, right? We're cardiac surgeons. So, I mean, you guys are experienced cardiac surgeons. You know that. So that cannot be violated. So how does that get violated? Well, if you have patients that have severe atherosclerotic peripheral vascular disease and you cannulate the left femoral artery and establish retrograde arterial perfusion at five to six liters per minute uh, and you've passed an end balloon up through there, then that's probably going to result in a stroke because you have sheared off a bunch of stuff that's gone to the brain, gone to the kidneys, gone to the gut, and that's, that's a serious problem. So we're going to talk about how to avoid that. Myocardial preservation. It's the essence of what we do, right? We do long operations. We stop the heart. We maintain the heart to make sure that it's well, uh, uh, that it's well preserved during that period of time. Um, you cannot violate that rule. If you do, then that's, a very, again, a very serious problem uh, for the patient. You cannot have compromised exposure. So you, what, whatever procedure that you're doing, mentally invasive or whatever, uh, in, in any way, you have to be able to see what you're working on. These are very, these are, uh, oh, yes, I, I agree with that. But, but you, when you're doing these cases, you have to make sure that they're set up and you have to anticipate that you're going to have the proper degree of exposure. And finally, you have to pick the right procedure. Now, you go, well, of course, I'm going to pick the right procedure. But in the past, there have been times when there have been cases where maybe we'll just do such and such, or maybe we'll do plan B because I can't quite see things. Nope, that's no good. That's not good for the patient. You choose the operation that you'd be doing through a sternotomy, and you make sure that you have the capability to be able to see and be able to have the exposure to do the proper operation. 
So let's take this, break this down though. So for this is for minimal incision AVR, okay? How, what, what, how do we need to think about those patients preoperatively? Um, the, so here again, I, I mentioned this before, we consider any patient with isolated aortic stenosis or aortic regurgitation and they have no coronary disease and have no history of atrial fibrillation. So already, see, we're beginning to section out those patients. We're beginning to divide out patients. Okay, the patient's got left main. Obviously, you're not going to do uh, a minimally invasive approach. The patient has uh, a history of persistent atrial fibrillation. You're not going to do a minimally invasive approach because you're going to be doing a COX-4 maze procedure. COX maze 4 procedure is what we would do here uh, and the aortic valve. Um, you have to consider, okay, am I going to do a mini upper sternotomy or am I going to do a right anterior thoracotomy? Clearly, if, you've just get, if you're just getting started in this, a mini upper sternotomy, and I'm going to show you this, um, is the way to go. You, don't, you do not want to start with a right anterior thoracotomy. That has its own separate issues. Um, we're, uh, the um, national co-chair on the Intuity valve called the Transform trial in this country was called the Triton trial in Europe, and we're now seeing data that shows um, that about 50% of the patients ha are having... Um, a minimally invasive approach for the insertion of the intuity valve, and I'll show you that just in a, in a little bit. But of those patients who are having a minimally invasive approach, only about five to six percent are having a right anterior thoracotomy. So the vast preponderance in this country of surgeons who are doing minimally invasive valve surgery do a mini upper sternotomy. Uh, body habit is considerations, very important. Obese patients, COPD, because somebody has COPD, the heart's going to be back further. The other thing is, and all of you have seen patients who have um, uh, hearts that are, rather than here, are like down here. And so the aortic valve goes with that. So if you're through a mini upper sternotomy incision up here, through about a um, two and a half inch incision, and your aortic valve is not where it's supposed to be, and as I say to the patients, you know, I want to make sure your heart's in the right place, that's why I get the CT scan, then if the aortic valve is down here, that is a problem. Obese patients, actually, mini upper sternotomy is a good procedure for obese patients. You just have to be aware of how much fat is over the sternum. And quite often, there's not very much fat. These patients do very well with this procedure. So we get a non-contrast CT, and it's essential uh, that uh, aortic calcification, aortic annulus location, all those things are to help you with the CT scan. We do that routinely. I will not do a minimally invasive approach without a CT scan. I think it's uh, standard of care. That's a little controversial. Uh, Dr. Uh, Youssef is going to be speaking in great detail about this because we feel like this is, is very important. But um, if you do minimally invasive valve surgery sooner or later without a CT, I think you're going to be unhappy. Um, so pre-op planning for a min minimal incision surgery, mitral valve repair. Uh, you really want to consider when you're starting out the complexity of the repair and your experience doing mitral valve surgery. First of all, I don't think anybody that has hasn't done at least 25 or 40 or 50 mitral valve repairs should be doing minimally invasive surgery. You should be very comfortable doing mitral valve repairs in general through a sternotomy. Uh, and you have to consider, are you doing cords? Are you doing resection? Are you doing just a ring or a combination thereof? Uh, coronary angiography is important. Of course, it's important in minimally invasive aortic valve. But here, I put this in here because you want to do coronary angiograms before you do a CTA of the chest, abdomen, and pelvis. Because if the patient's got coronary disease, there's no reason to get the CTA of the chest, abdomen, and pelvis. Plus, we have several cases now, and Sam, Dr. Youssef will show you this, where the patient underwent uh, uh, femoral coronary angiography, and they have an intimal flap in their femoral artery, and which is no problem if the blood's going anagrade, but you take that patient to the operating room two to three weeks later after their, their uh, cardiac catheterization, and you establish five to six liters per minute retrograde arterial flow, you're going to get a dissection. So very early on in the end of balloon experience, it was, uh, it was a concern raised that the end of balloon, quote, caused aortic dissection. The end of balloon does not cause aortic dissection. What was happening, this was back in the two th early 2000s when we did not have CT scan, um, I'm, I'm convinced that what was happening is a fair number of those patients were having this animal flap to occur, and the surgeon took the patient to the operating room, didn't know about CT, established uh, retrograde flow, and caused the dissection retrograde all the way back to the root. 
So we will not take a patient to the operating room who has had coronary angiography without doing a CT, at least of the, if they've already had a CTA of the chest, abdomen, and pelvis for some reason, and then they get coronary angiograms from a femoral cath, I'll take them back to the CT lab and have just a pelvic run done to make sure that they don't have that, because that, be, that would be very serious. There's Dr. Youssef just entered, so good morning. He's going to be talking a little bit about CT a little bit later. Um, so has a patient had previous right chest surgery? Very important. Um, do they have adhesions over there? Because that's a very serious problem. You're going to be working through an incision, initially maybe six, seven centimeters, but ultimately three to four centimeters. And you, if the adhesions are there, that could be detrimental to the patient. So you're going to want to know about that. Uh, has a patient had trauma? Have they had fractured ribs? Do they have a pectus? pectus? If the patient has a pectus, that's a very serious problem because the heart is all displaced, it's pushed down. You cannot really expose the patient, like expose the mitral valve like you want to. Kyphoscoliosis is a problem because if the heart moves way over here, then it may actually be out of reach of your instruments. And again, that's a problem. So these are considerations that you need to, need to really think about uh, in planning. This is sort of small, and I'm sorry, but maybe you can see it on the screen. So this is the comorbidities of mentally invasive surgery and potential complications. Uh, this is a, uh, from a paper that we have uh, submitted and should be coming out hopefully in the next few months. So here's the comorbidity, and here are the potential complications. So morbid obesity, uh, compromised exposure, significant lung disease, postoperative respiratory failure, um, Peripheral vascular disease, malperfusion, and possible arterial injury, including aortic dissection, which is the, the worst nightmare for the mentally invasive surgeon. Um, <clears throat> advanced renal dysfunction, postoperative renal failure. Uh, advanced liver disease, postoperative hepatic failure. These cases take longer, so you're, you're a little bit longer on the cross clamp. So these issues, if they are there preoperatively, are going to be uh, aggravated um, in the postoperative period. Has the patient had a previous right thoracotomy? Um, it can really compromise the exposure, and, um, and you can have lung injury, which is a, is a pretty serious problem after uh, the procedure. Does the patient have significant pulmonary hypertension? And if they do, and what is significant? Uh, you know, anything over about 50, 55 systolic gets my attention in, in evaluating a patient for mentally invasive surgery. Uh, they, they can have an inadequate postoperative RV function. We're not quite sure why this is, because you think you'd be able to protect the heart just the same, but it's a clinical observation. There's no data, but Randy Chitwood and I and others have seen this in patients who have significant pulmonary hypertension, especially when you're talking about in the 60s and 70s. That's very concerning for doing minimally invasive um, of valve surgery. And severe LV dysfunction. What is severe? I'd say anything less than about 25% probably ought to be done open because you're going to, you may going to want to be getting to that ventricle and in, 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 uh, in other ways because you can end up with a postoperative LV function, uh, dysfunction. So preoperative planning, MIS, mitral valve repair, contraindications. Um, consider you need to have routine, and I should have put in here preoperative, routine preoperative TEE. We do that routinely on everybody here. Because uh, you want to know going in exactly what's your valve pathology. Uh, transthoracic is okay, but TE really tells you exactly what's wrong with the valve. Uh, mitral annular calcification, I, in my opinion, and in most mentally invasive surgeons' opinion, is a contraindication due to inability to reconstruct the mitral annulus. We're pretty quick nowadays if there is mitral annular calcification to, once you take out the mitral valve and take out as much of that calcium as you need, to rebuild that with a bovine pericardial patch. We just sort of routinely do that now because it's much better to do that than to come off the pump and find out you've got AV disruption. And then you have to go back in, take the valve out, and I don't have to tell you guys that, that that's, a, that's a lethal complication. So we're pretty quick to do that. You cannot see, in a minimally invasive approach, the left ventricular aspect to be able to put those sutures in. You just can't see it. So if you have somebody with any degree of significant MAC at all that you think you're going to have to deal with, don't do that case mentally basically. Um, if there's presence of anything more than mild aortic regurgitation, uh, it's a contraindication due to inability to decompress the heart upon aortic cross clamp removal. So again, whether you're using a cross clamp or whether you're using the end of balloon, and Dr. Laird's going to go into that. Uh, when you let that, at the end of the case, you let the balloon down or you let the, take the cross clamp off and they have more than mild AR, 
and the ventricle gets distended, there's nothing you can do about it through this incision, right? I mean, if, you've, if you're open, then if that happens, and I'm sure that's happened to you on occasion, you can massage the heart and sort of get the heart going, but decompress the heart manually, or put the cross clamp back on and figure out how are you, how are you gonna get, get through that. I've had one case where I actually had to replace the aortic valve uh, in a patient who had sort of moderate AR. Could never get the thing uh, decompressed enough. So, so, but you don't wanna be from the right chest on that. Pulmonary hypertension we've talked about, and poor LV function we've talked about. Um, so what are the goals of cannulation and, perf and perfusion, especially when it comes to minimally invasive mitral valve repair? Well, you want to provide complete drainage uh, to the heart because the, the left atrium, or the, excuse me, the right atrium will be in your way if it's not completely decompressed. And if you're using a vacuum and you've chosen the correct size venous cannula, then the, um, uh, the right atrium is just basically going to get sucked down on the camera. I mean, it'll be totally out of your way, but you want that definitely um, decompressed. Obviously, you want to provide adequate systemic perfusion, um, and you want to minimize the risk of malperfusion or any vascular injury. Uh, the CTA, the chest, abdomen, and pelvis is essential for that. Some of this is repeat, but I think repetition leads to success. So it's very important. We feel very important here that, that this is a key element uh, to success of uh, minimally invasive valve programs. And, you know, you want to minimize the, the added time and, and cost to the procedure. So you want to have all this planned preoperatively, okay? If this doesn't, so for instance, a good example of this is I've, if I've got a little lady, a little petite lady, um, my CTA will tell me that her, um, that her femoral arteries are maybe six millimeters. So I may go ahead and plan on doing bilateral cannulation because I use the end of balloon. So I'll cannulate over here for retrograde arterial perfusion. I'll cannulate over here for the end of balloon. And, you know, through incisions that are about like this. So that's no big deal as long as you know about it and you think about it ahead of time. So myocardial protection, Dr. Lair is going to go into great detail about this, but just as an overview, there are three options for myocardial protection. There's ventricular fibrillatory arrest. We would not advise that as a mainstay of uh, myocardial preservation. We do not do that here in this program unless there are circumstances that um, make uh, cross clamping and end of balloon not ideal. Um, but there's plenty of literature now to show that this results in significant um, um, injury, um, cerebral injury, and, uh, and strokes and that type of thing. Uh, plus, the other problem is, is that it has compromised the field, so it's violated one of our inviolate principles. I mean, you, uh, you start pulling up around A1, uh, P1 uh, on the retractor to C, uh, and when you get into that area with your sutures, it makes the aortic valve incompetent, and the field gets flooded. You have to start all over again. So it, it's not a good choice doing these cases routinely like that. You have the aortic cross clamp. That's what we're all very familiar with. That's what we deal with day in and day out um, with anti-grade, retrograde cardioplegia. And you can use the uh, intraclude, the end of balloon, which is what uh, I use and uh, the other surgeons here use to some degree with anti-grade, retrograde cardioplegia. So... You may get, it's good to have all of these in your armamentarium because you may get into cases where for some reason this doesn't work, you can fall back to this, or you may get into the case and something happens. The aortic cross clamp slips or the uh, end of balloon deflates or the end of balloon pops. And sort of depending upon where you are in your case, you can go ahead and finish the case with ventricular fibrillatory arrest, say if you're near two thirds, three quarters of the way through it. So what are the anesthesia considerations then? Uh, in the pre-op planning. Well, they are pretty extensive. And again, Dr. Stout's going to go over these in detail, but I'm just going to, this is sort of the overview part of the, of the uh, symposium. Um, the anesthesiologist really needs to have a comprehensive understanding of the procedure. And he is your partner. Your anesthesiologist is your partner. So if you are starting or have started a program, um, then I would strongly recommend that you identify at least one or two anesthesiologists that are passionate with you to go do this. You can't just have several coming in the room, sort of, you know, one day it's this guy, one day it's that guy. You're going to have to concentrate your experience and your experiential base with those individuals. It's very important. Uh, they are your imager. Uh, they guide your venous cannula. They guide your end of balloon. Um, they, uh, of course, assess what the valve pathology is preoperatively. They assess the results of the 
of the procedure at the end of the case. Everybody in the room gets a vote on how well the valve is repaired after a mitral except for the surgeon. Uh, the anesthesiologist gets two votes and everybody else gets uh, one vote and the surgeon gets no vote. So uh, that's, that's how we deal with that here. Uh, retrograde coronary sinus catheter um, uh, is very important. We feel it's essential for providing adequate myocardial preservation. And finally, pulmonary artery vent we use here quite frequently. The pulmonary artery vent, when you look at it, it's like a little noodle. And surgeons are very skeptical that it can drain uh, uh, anything. But we use it routinely. We use it routinely on our um, MIS AVR cases. And it provides very, very adequate drainage if it's properly positioned. And David's going to go into that. So in summary, um, the, uh, uh, for aortic valve replacement and mitral valve replacement, there really are different considerations that you need to think about. They're very distinct. Some, there are some that are, are uh, for both, but some are very different, and you need to consider all of those. Um, and really, CTA, I can't stress this enough, we feel like here is essential for, for planning, especially in mitral valve disease, CT, non-contrast CT, is essential for uh, AVR. And so these, <clears throat> the testing preoperatively and examination of the patient, all those things will allow you to figure out your strategies for cannulation, for perfusion, uh, myocardial preservation, all of that you can think about ahead of time so that you have a mindset going in with contingency plans if they don't work out. Uh, and again, just to reiterate, do not violate the four principles that we talked about in the beginning. <clears throat> 